Good evening, hello. Um, I'd just like to uh, offer my congratulations as well to the Miners Library on, on the 50th anniversary. That's an incredible achievement and a, a, a venerable and extremely useful institution. Um, and also, of course, my sympathies and condolences to both Julian and Dr. Francis, um, both of whom I met and who were kind enough to lend their support to, to what we were trying to do in, in, admittedly, slightly different ways, I suppose. But um, uh, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's very touching that this, this evening is dedicated to them, and I, I, hope, it, uh, I hope I can uh, speak with some kind of degree of eloquence and lucidity to match the importance of that dedication. Um, yes, it's a fantastic honour to have been asked um, to come back to, to Swansea to give this talk. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it really is one of the furthest things from my kind of hopes and dreams, I suppose, for making this record. You know, I started out making this record in early 2016, and I think if you could have told me then how things would pan out, both in terms of the working relationships with the archives that we dealt with, and also with the musicians and the communities that we dealt with, and the relationships that we managed to build in Ebervale and, and elsewhere, um, I think it would have been beyond my wildest dreams to, to be given the honor of coming back here for such a uh, fantastic occasion. So my thanks for asking me here. I think I've been somewhat overbilled uh, personally, but um, yeah, I'm gonna do my best to, to kind of live up to the billing, I suppose. Um, now, I'm not gonna assume that everybody here knows who we are or, or what we do or who I am or, or how we do, so I thought what might be most useful is, is almost a kind of case study of you know how we came to be as a band how we came to operate the way we do why we do that um, and why we reached the point where we wanted to make what was for us then quite a different record which would rely on different kinds of materials being gathered in different ways and even to some extent gathered by by us going out and doing interviews and recording with people um, and in so doing hopefully uh, you know inspire others of you who work in academia who work in libraries who work in ways that can kind of facilitate those kind of collaborations and make these archives, you know, visible to parts of the public who might not otherwise engage with them and hopefully give some kind of level of, uh, of understanding of, of how it all came to pass, really. Um, so the record we are going to talk about is this one from 2017. It's called um, Every Valley, named after a, um, a public transport film, actually, from the 1940s. It's, it's also a line from Handel's Requiem, which makes me sound very knowledgeable and musical, but um, no, it was named after a film about buses. Um, and uh, yeah, this was, this was an unusual record for us, as, as I say. And I think to have gone from where, where I started, this kind of started as a one-man thing in, in my bedroom, in a flat in Tooting, to have gone from how, how I kind of started playing around with this material to, to a record like this is, is quite a remarkable journey. And I don't say that to blow my own trumpet, I just mean in terms of of the possibilities of imagination and creativity and also support from archive institutions and how those forward-thinking archive institutions, which is not sadly all of them, and those who are kind of able to commercially support, you know, burgeoning, nascent kind of, um, uh, almost like kind of startup bands, I suppose, like us, with, with kind of accommodating rates and accommodating kind of arrangements, um, you know, the benefits that you could see as a result of that. So public service broadcasting started back in, it was kind of in 2008, informally, I was making um, instrumental music on my own. I'd been in various kind of half-rate bands for many years, all of which had kind of dissolved in failure, and I'd given up on becoming a musician of any kind whatsoever, and just decided to do something for fun. So my idea of fun was um, making instrumental, mostly electronic music, and then I heard, appropriately enough, an archive hour program on Radio 4, talking about the BFI, the British Film Institute, and their release of some materials online um, and encouraging people to go on and, and look for them. So uh, I was kind of looking for a way to give the music that I was making some personality because it's hard with the instrumental music to, to kind of get, you know, to kind of give it a hook that people can kind of latch onto, I suppose. And I thought this might be a way of doing it. So the first film that I kind of set eyes on and ended up using was this from the BFI archive. Now, I'm going to show you three things, and you've got to tell me what you will do. Number one, a pint of tea. Well, you seem to know what to do with that, one, all right. Number two, a handkerchief. Excellent. Remember, coughs and sneezes spread diseases. Now, number three, a bowl of disinfectant. Hey, you don't drink it, man. 
That's for the soiled handkerchief, which is full of germs. You put the handkerchief into the disinfectant, which kills the germs and so stops the spread of infection. Now, let's get this quite clear. You sneeze into the handkerchief and then put the handkerchief into a bowl of disinfectant to kill the germs, not in with the family's washing. Got it? Sure? Good. Remember, don't spread germs. So yeah, that's, that's the film, Don't Spread Germs, a sequel to Coughs and Sneezes Spread Diseases. Um, I kind of think they should have been given another run out a couple of years ago, actually. Um, <clears throat> but sadly, they were underutilized. Um, should have a word of Professor Valence, maybe. Um, and from that film, uh, I ended up making this kind of rather sort of whimsical, uh, I'll play a short bit of the, the very first PSB demo that was, which is called Three Things. Now, I'm going to show you three things, and you've got to tell me what you do with them. Number one, Number two. Kind of, it was almost almost window dressing, I suppose. It was kind of uh, using quite kitsch samples in a way to add a bit of personality to music that was otherwise slightly lacking, and you know, being quite playful with them in the process. You know, sort of chopping up a film about three very different other things and using it to kind of uh, express musical ideas instead. Um, so that led to me kind of starting to do gigs. This is me in my then local pub, the Selkirk in Tooting. This is the very first PSB gig, so it was just me and some wires and uh, yeah. Hasn't really. I think this is the same computer, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, and you know, a bit of guitar, a bit of banjo. There was no visual element whatsoever. Um, the visual element came from me using that. Uh, you can just about make out there a theremin. I kind of wafted my hand around that to try and get people interested. But um, bizarrely enough, and it, it still does surprise me, it did generate you know positive response more than any other musical thing that I've done in the past. So I kind of picked it up and ran with it. Really, this is me taking the show to the Fringe in Edinburgh in 2010. Um, by which point I had edited videos to run concurrently with the songs that I was playing, which, um, which was a great help because I'm quite devoid of kind of, well, I'd say quite devoid of charisma full stop, especially performing charisma. I'm not actually the most kind of uh, free and expressive person on stage, so it was great to just plonk a TV at the front of the stage and say, don't watch me, watch that. Um, and it worked, you know, it was, it was very effective. This is me putting myself in the, in the literal shop window. This is... Um, Trendy Curtain Road in Shoreditch. This is the vintage dress shop I was gigging in. Ended up being um, approached by the person who owned this shop, who was a, a music manager, as it turned out, and thought that maybe we could kind of have a bit of a, you know, one or two interesting summers on the festival circuit, playing this kind of novelty gigs, and you know, being vaguely kitsch in the way that we were, I suppose. Um, so kind of, this is all quite unlikely beginnings for, for a musical project anyway, but I think especially unlikely beginnings for, for you know, ending up here talking to you today at such a kind of prestigious event as this about a record that we made that is uh, an entirely different proposition, I think. I think a big step for me was um, it got to the stage where I'd just use all these clips without permission because who cared? I was a, nobody, you know, nobody was going to buy my music, nobody was going to listen to it particularly, so I just kind of got on with it. Um, and we started to get played on the radio, so I thought oh, I'd probably better phone somebody actually um, and try and get permission. So I phoned the BFI and spoke to a lovely lady there who was very confused, um, but receptive, receptive and confused, which is a good blend for an, for a, an archive institution. There's plenty more who just send you the commercial rates card, and uh, that's the end of the conversation, sadly. Um, and she, uh, she asked me to send her a, a demonstration of my work, and I sent her one about driving safety, which is called Signal 30. And um, I think, by the, by the sounds of things, they, they gathered around in the office and watched it, her and her boss and a couple of others, and and gave it a thumbs up, um, remarkably. And that led to us being able to use the BFI's, ar BFI's archive in our work kind of under a relatively unofficial arrangement to start with, which was then solidified as we start to find some, some kind of uh, unpredicted success, I suppose. And a big sort of step change in the way that we worked was I started to think, 
is this just a novelty thing or is there more that you can do with archive than just kind of sprinkling these, you know, almost like, you know, window dressing type things on, on a song? Is there more that you can do with it? Could you, for example, write a record all about one subject and kind of start to weave a bit of a narrative through that music, thereby making it more emotional, giving the listener something to invest in, giving it some kind of more gravitas, um, you know, and making it seem like a more serious proposition? Uh, it's, it, it was very fun in the early days, kind of mucking about fun, but, you know, like all kind of big-headed musicians, eventually you want to be taken seriously, I suppose. This is the, this is the early steps of that for me. And um, the big, big step forward for us was The War Room, which was released in 2012, and we used BFI Archive all across that, and including the, the feature film, The First of the Few, which was suggested to us by them, actually, for usage. So this is a song that we made from that called Spitfire. It's tiring, always stretching up for something that's just out of reach. But I get it. After all, what I want isn't as easy as all that. Got to do 400 miles an hour. Turn on a sixpence, climb 10,000 feet in a few minutes. Dive at 500 without the wings coming off. Carry eight machine guns. Hello, Hunter Leader, Hunter Leader. Bandits approaching Beachy from southeast. Angels 1-5. Over. Bandits are now about three to four miles south of Beachy. You should see them in a minute. They're down south of you. Hello, Hunter Leader. Hunter Leader. Flap on control. Falling. Can you see them? Can you see them? So yeah, that, that kind of puts on the map a little bit. Um, and people, people found it so much easier to kind of get their, you know, attach their emotions to, to something like a song about Spitfire because they obviously bring all their passions and all their, their interests in life to, to whatever they listen to. But when you give them something like that, which has kind of much more open and sort of interesting and attractive framework rather than just being kind of quite shallow and frothy, you find that people start to take it more seriously and they start to recognise that actually there maybe is more depth to this than, than a lot of people, myself included, in the early days would attach to it. Um, so yeah, we kind of picked, picked that up and ran with it, really. We released our first record the year after that and toured a lot. We played 156 shows in 2013 alone, which I still can't quite believe we survived. Um, and then we released very swiftly after that first record, we released The Race for Space, which was a kind of very narrative-driven record in 2015, using, again, BFI footage for the Soviet um, side of the space race and NASA audio collection stuff for the American side of it. And from very kind of, you know, extremely humble beginnings, um, you know, I was, I was more surprised than anybody to find us on stage at Brixton Academy and as a South London, you know, as somebody who grew up in South London, went to that venue a lot to see incredible bands like, like the Manic Street Preachers, who we'll talk about in a bit. Um, to kind of find yourself on that stage performing these songs is, yeah, it was so far beyond any kind of hopes or dreams I had for, for PSB as, in terms of what it could do. Um, it really, yeah, it was, it was, yeah, well, hopefully if I sh I'll show you the video and you can hopefully uh, identify with how, it, how alien and uh, uh, exciting I found it. <laughs> Like a, like a lot of dreams, you know, you kind of, if you're lucky enough to achieve it, um, you kind of, I remember getting to the end of that concert and playing, I think it was the penultimate song and thinking, well, what now? Uh, is that it? You know, um, where do we go from here? This is, this is so far beyond what I thought we could do. Um, I've been listening to the new Wilco record this week, which is co-produced actually by one of Wales's finest, Kate LeBon. I highly recommend it if you're looking for some new music. And there's a line on, on one of the songs there, which is, I've outlived my dreams. And I thought, yeah, I kind of, I know how that feels. Um, and, and I was at that point in 2015, at the tail end of 2015, trying to work out what to do next with the band. Um, that record, The Race of Space, has subsequently gone on to become gold certified in the UK, which means 100,000 copies. I don't mention that to boast, I just mention that because it was self-released on our own label, entirely self-produced. Um, we secured a bit of funding for it, but otherwise it was an entirely kind of homebrew thing. It was, I like to see it as kind of the equivalent of 
a non-league team winning the FA Cup or something. It's really, it shouldn't happen. That, that shouldn't happen. It's marvellous that it did, and I think it's testament to kind of the health of, of the alternative music scene in the UK, despite many people's best efforts to curtail those. Um, so, yeah, it, it just... I, I didn't know where to go with the project from there. Um, do you kind of chase ever larger crowds? Do you try and go to arena level? Do you repeat the thing that was successful in the hope that you found something that people like? You should just carry on doing it forever and make people happy. Um, or do you try and take a more interesting kind of imaginative and creative leap and continue to kind of test the concept of the band and you know this, this institution of our own that we were building and see how far you can go with it? You know, you've just made a record all about superhuman achievements, extraterrestrial activity, um, that was this kind of universal. Can you make, I don't know, something much more specific and local to a particular community? Can you make something about, um, you know, for all the best will in the world, a less glamorous subject? You know, something that's not likely to kind of get five-year-old, seven-year-old kids excited about it as, as readily. Um, so for me, I started to kind of gravitate towards the idea of working with industrial material or industrial history material. And that led to, you know, early, early searches. This is the BFI Advanced Search. Um, which anybody can access on their website just to see what kind of materials that they hold. And this is just a generic search for mining, but, you know, there's, there's 463 results for that alone. And, and I was aware that they had the National Coal Board footage and that we would be able to license that through our existing relationship with them. So there was an element of kind of pragmatism to, to the road that we ended up going down to, which there has to be when you're relying on the kind of the goodwill and the provision of material from other people for your records. So having kind of decided that... Industrial history would be an interesting challenge, you know, sort of from a songwriting perspective and also from a kind of personal perspective. Um, I started to read kind of more widely about, well, about the history of coal mining in particular in this country and, and just found myself more and more drawn to a particular community, being the community in South Wales, um, how strong it was during the strike of the 80s, how kind of united and... and how, um, how much solidarity there was here, I suppose, in comparison to some other parts of the country. And I started to wonder if you could kind of zoom in, if you could really put one particular region under the microscope and tell that region's story, um, you know, in relative detail compared to the kind of very broad stroke stuff that we'd done, would that perhaps invite people to make their own comparisons with their own industry? You know, when we were playing Every Valley up in Newcastle, for example, or Sunderland, or, um, you know, they've had a similar kind of industrial decline to the rest of the country in the 80s and, and 90s. And it's not much of an extrapolation for them to kind of hopefully take something so geolocated and so specific to one community and kind of by shining a light so brightly in one part do you kind of explain the wider part more effectively than doing something so kind of broad strokes, I suppose. So I started to kind of mentally zoom in on, on South Wales as, as an idea. And the BFI were kind enough to provide me with this list of um, NCB films, which was very handily catalogued by uh, county and region divisions, so I could narrow it down to what was on offer from South Wales or from Wales uh, more widely and start to think about, is there a story that you could tell, um, you know, using the archive? Uh, how could you kind of tell the story of... of the days when mining was a prestigious and, and uh, you know, key to the community industry to the, the mid-80s and the sort of the early 90s when it had become a political punching bag and the communities that had thrived off the back of it had been so kind of remorselessly and, uh, and cynically torn to shreds, really. Um, you know, was there a way of kind of weaving your way through that using archive material? Or if not archive material, maybe you could think laterally. Maybe there were other materials that you could use. And that was a challenge because, you know, previously I'd worked a lot further in the past. 80s and 90s was much more recent then sort of 72 was, was the, the last event on the race for space. It's a bit of a jump. It's much more into kind of uh, everyday political consciousness, I suppose, everyday memory, a lot more raw. Um, and obviously uh, not something that I have particular experience of either. I was, I was extremely aware of that. I still am aware of that coming here today, you know, with somebody with rampant imposter syndrome to stand here today giving a 50th anniversary talk on the South Wales Miners Library feels... Um, feels, <laughs> well, inappropriate to me, but it's very nice to have been asked, I suppose. But, um, you know, how, how, do I, how do I not just be a kind of vampiric, you know, London kind of media type person just descending on this story, adapting it for my own needs and sort of, you know, taking it back to London and, and not forging any kind of bonds with the community, not, not asking for permission in a way. Um, 
how could I go about kind of forging some bonds in the community and, and meeting some people and asking, asking their blessing, I suppose, in a way, and asking their permission to tell this story. So um, the way I start most records is just with reading. Uh, off, you know, as much as it is about checking whether archive materials exist, it's about reading. Um, one book that I found that was particularly useful was kind of um, self-published, I think. Um, it's kind of oral history. It was interviews by the authors, Deborah Price and Natalie Butts Thompson. It was called How Black Were Our Valleys, and uh, it featured testimony, I think, from you know, I think Ron Stotes in there. Uh, I think there, there are many people they put me in touch with subsequently who are kind of um, you know, big figures from, from the South Wales mining coalfield history. So I got in touch with Deborah and said, you know, I've read your book. It was, it was you know, exactly the sort of material that I'm after. Um, and I asked her for, for a couple of things, really. First of all was, you know, would, you, would it be possible to introduce me to some of these people? I'd like to talk to myself. I'd like to do some of our own interviews. I'd like to kind of meet people in the community and see if there's a kind of a resistance to what I'd like to do. And second of all, what do you think? You know, do you think we should be doing this? Is this something that's our right to tell? And, and um, she was incredibly generous. She, she just gave me nothing but encouragement for it and said, just go for it. I think she'd had a similar kind of experience writing this book and worrying about you know, whether or not being directly descended from coal mine workers, um, she had a right to tell that story. Uh, but she was given that encouragement and she was very kind in, in passing that on to me. I think as long as you kind of um, approach the subject matter that you're approaching, when it is a sensitive one like this, if you approach it from the outside, I think if you do it with a degree of sensitivity, if you do it with a degree of uh, generosity of spirit, if you do it with the kind of the right intentions and... Um, the right kind of open-heartedness, I suppose. Uh, hopefully, you'll be rewarded for that in terms of people recognising you for being genuinely interested in this and not kind of just using it for your own selfish ends. And I was very pleased that, that Deborah was the, the first in a very, very long chain of people who were so welcoming and supportive of, of her efforts. So I kind of I stepped up my research off the back of that. I started contacting people and I started delving into the BFI archive. Um, uh, I knew roughly by that point the story that I wanted to tell. I wanted to start when mining was, as Richard Burton says on the record, you know, you know, when they were the kings of the coal field, when, when you know, miners used to be able to kind of look down on the, the doctor's daughters and the, the teacher's daughters because they were kind of, you know, um, they were this kind of prestigious, uh, you know, kind of lordly class in a way. Um, I wanted to tell that story from where, where that started and, and the kind of the reinforcement of mining as a, as a noble industry, as the backbone of Britain, as something that supported the war effort enormously. Um, there's a line in The Pit, which is the second song on the record saying, the people of Britain are building, hewing out from our native rock, the foundations of the future. And of course they were, and they had been for hundreds of years before that. But how do you go from that point to what happened further down the line? Um, where these people who you've been lionising as kind of the real spirit of the country who are kind of providing the foundations for everything that we relied on and all of our kind of industrial advancement, how do you go from that to them becoming the enemy who are to be defeated at all costs, uh, including great costs to themselves, of course. So I started going into the archive. Many of you will be familiar with this, I'm sure, but this is People Will Always Need Coal from 1975, which is a BFI um, licensed material. Um, that's 1975. <laughs> And uh, other lines that we used in our version of that song, People Always Need Coal, included that the South Wales, that South Wales coal field will be turning out coal for 400 years. And that was from a similar era film. So how do you get from that point to, um, you know, to what, what came later? Um, I'll just briefly play you our version of that, which took that opening jingle and then kind of went off the back of that into something else. I think I was quite comfortable with the first half of the record because I knew I wanted to set, set mining up using this kind of archive material as, as that kind of, you know, sort of lofty and lauded profession, dangerous. I wanted to make sure that, that was highlighted. Um, but, you know, a, a bright future, 
Um, and, you know, I, I knew I could tell that story with the archive material that the BFI had. I knew that was possible. What I didn't know how to do was the second half of the record and getting onto much more contemporary sources. I didn't know where to find those sources. I didn't know how to get permission to use them. I wanted to make sure we used voices from the area and wanted to use kind of genuine oral history from South Wales, if I could, um, to tell that story. So how to go about you know, finding that, essentially. Um, and from, from speaking to Deborah and speaking to, to, to some other folks, she, she kindly uh, introduced me to Kerry down at Big Pit and took me there and I met him and you know, had a kind of bit of a, a mini tour there and, and Deborah and I went down into, you know, did the kind of tour underground, which um, convinced me more than anything that mining would not have, well, not have been a strong point for me personally. Um, and she was kind enough to introduce me to Ron Stote, who mentioned um, Wayne Thomas earlier, but Ron's another kind of uh, NUM South Wales stalwart. He, he pops up on a lot of documentaries about it. He's a great talker. Um, he was very generous with his time and, and his support for this as well. He was never very keen on the fact I wore a bow tie, though, on stage and um, quite frequently took me to task over that. So I'm not wearing one in his honour tonight. Um, and I ended up, you know, I, I interviewed some of these people. I interviewed Ron, I interviewed Wayne down in, in uh, the NUM headquarters here. And some of Ron's interview actually made it onto the record. But in the process of those interviews, which for me were a very useful, were a very useful experience in terms of meeting people and kind of understanding... Uh, you know, the perspective here and kind of ridding myself of some of the preconceptions I had about certain aspects of the strike in particular. Um, I kind of discovered this problem of, of tense, really, which is that interviewing people today about what happened in the 80s, you swiftly move into the past tense and it sounds, it, it just has a way of feeling like it was a very long time ago. And when you're looking to kind of tell a story that has impact and immediacy and drama, um, that kind of shift between tenses start to feel like a bit of a problem for me. So I, I continued to kind of spread the net wide um, in the hope of turning up some, you know, useful material. I went up to the National Coal Mining Museum for England up in Wakefield, uh, which has its own library there. And that's, uh, ironically enough, in Wakefield is where I discovered the Idris Davis poem, uh, Gwali Deserta, which we ended up adapting with James Dean Bradfield of the Mannix for our song Turn No More. That's where I discovered that, um, uh, that poem. And I continued reading more widely around, around the subject. Um, I came to Dr. Ben Curtis's book, The South Wales Miners, 1964-1985. Uh, this, is, this is one of the most useful things that I, I read across the entire period. Um, I did promise Ben I'd give him a plug for his book. Not that he asked for one, but it is a fantastic book. And um, I think it really helped give me a grounding, especially for the kind of the political... Um, the kind of politically radical, I suppose, in the broader context of the UK element of the South Wales coal field, which, which Dr. Francis was actually quite keen to impress upon me when we met as well. He wanted to make sure I, I understood that. Um, and this book went a long way to helping me with that. But one of, the, one of the main things that came out of it was reading it. I realised that uh, he was making reference to interviews that he'd recorded. So the, the kind of the testimonial and the testament of these, these miners that were, you know, giving such character and, and uh, authenticity to this book maybe they still exist somewhere. Maybe I could get in touch with Ben and ask him, could I, could I listen to it? Could I use it? Um, so as, as I kind of do, I just found his details and, and got in touch with him. And he told me he didn't have the tapes anymore. He'd given them to the South Wales Miners Library, which is how I came to, to kind of descend upon on, on, uh, on that venerable institution, how I came to meet Sean and the others um, down there. And I basically went down there for, for I think it was about a week and a half, of purely listening to audio cassettes and swiftly realized that I wasn't going to get through them in time, so I bought this, um, hang on, that's the wrong order. I bought this, <laughs> uh, which is a kind of, um, it's a transcribing machine. Uh, normally, if I'm listening to kind of digital clips to help me get through them more quickly, you can just kind of speed them up digitally. But this is a very analog way of doing it. It does have a little kind of, um, that's wrong again. Sorry, these seem to have got out of order on there. They're on order here. Okay. Right. Apologies for this. There you go. I have no idea why it wasn't there before, but there it is. Uh, speed control. So I found myself in, in the South West Miners Library listening to um, quite strong regional accents, we say. And I, I like to think I've got a reasonable ear for these things, but I swiftly learned that 
one and a half speed listening to very heavy Welsh accents was not something that was going to help me um, discern what was going on so much. But I did I still use this in enabling me to speed things up a bit and get through a lot of material. I listened to a lot of Ben's tapes and I asked Sean and the team at the, at the library, was there, was there any other kind of oral history that I could maybe listen to from the time? And they gave me you know, a whole kind of box full of, of stuff um, to go through, some of which um, included interviews with Margaret Donovan and also Christine Powell, who I can see here today. Um, and people often ask me, you know, how do you know, how do you know what clips to use when you're looking through archive? Like, what, how do you choose them? And I, I, I don't kind of want to give a, a fatuous answer, but it, it's just obvious. You know, even when you're listening at, at sort of a speed and a half, speed and a third or whatever, um, there's a kind of, there's a, there's a change in the rhythm of people's voices almost when they're going to say something that means something deeply to them and that comes from the heart. And it's going to kind of uh, elucidate a wider truth, I suppose. And I think, I think everyone would be able to pick that up if you were to listen to a tape. You'd be able to kind of say, that's the bit, that's the bit. And this is what I heard at the South Hills Miners Library going through those tapes. I do, I suppose it goes back really to the fact that out of a pile of grandchildren, I'm the only girl, you know. He was like, you can't climb up the street, you're a girl. You can't come with us because you're a girl. And it made me damn determined to do it. And I suppose it sort of stuck with me. So I, I, I didn't see any reason why I shouldn't get, be out there doing what I was doing, why, why I shouldn't go pick it in, why, why I, I shouldn't be in the support group or whatever. But I, I could see it later on that there's a, a lot of women who weren't as fortunate as me. If they were sort of brought up in a more traditional style, shall, shall we say. They weren't taught to wire a plug, they were taught to make a sponge. They weren't taught how to change the wheel on the car. Uh, they were taught the proper way to wear in a white shirt, sort of thing. I mean, it's just obvious to me. I mean, Christine's in the front row here kind of flinching, hearing her own voice, which is, which is an experience that we all have, I'm sure. But um, it's just, this, this, there's a great deal of profundity in there, I think. There's a great deal of power. And when you hear that, um, it's, just, it's just obvious. So I, I kind of, ha having found a few of these clips, you know, across, across my research there, I, I spoke to Sean about the possibility of kind of, you know, procuring some kind of license for them. I was aware that it might not be something that they'd done particularly a great deal in the past. They might not kind of have as formal of a framework as as even a relatively informal institution like the BFI might have. Um, I was aware that it was quite a big ask and it was quite an imposition. And um, I think it was, it's really testament to kind of her and her approach to running the South Wales Miners Library, not only the support that I had during the research, but the support that I had in kind of following that research through and being able to use those materials and kind of bring this, this audio sat on a cassette, you know, in a, in, in a box in the South Wales Miners Library, which I'm sure is being listened to regularly, but maybe bring it to people who aren't going to, be in the South West Miners Library listening to it, you know, have to, to reach a wider audience. And I think it was, it was a similar kind of generosity of spirit that I hoped to kind of bring to my efforts to tell this story that I found at the South West Miners Library with Sean and the team. Um, but she was, she was great in kind of, in terms of almost vouching for us, I suppose, vouching for me and, and what I was going to try and do with it and kind of doing a lot of the behind the scenes work to ask people would they be willing to let their voices be used on our music. Um, and thankfully, we got permission for, for that clip, um, and it ended up in our, our song, They Gave Me a Lamp, which I'd kind of, I'd been scouring the archives, particularly with a view to women's voices and wanting to make sure women's support groups were represented on the record, being such a, a vital part of, of um, you know, that industrial dispute in the, in the 80s, and how kind of, how it was a catalyst politically for a lot of women, especially, um, you know, to become politically active and to become engaged in a way that they hadn't previously been. So it was, um, it was fantastic to find that clip and to be given permission to use it in this way. A lot of women weren't as fortunate as me. They weren't taught to wear your plug, they were taught to make a sponge. They weren't taught how to change the wheel on the car. They were taught the proper way to wear in a white shirt. You can't climb up the street, you're a girl. You can't come with us because you're a girl. And it made me damn determined to do it. And I suppose it sort of stuck with me. So I, I, I didn't see any reason why I shouldn't be out there doing what I was doing, why I shouldn't go pick it in, why I shouldn't be in the support group. I think a lot of women found their feet.
So, you know, it, it ended up forming kind of the backbone of that track and, and kind of a moral, moral compass for that song and, and the record in a way. Um, and it, it solved the problem that I had of relying on historical BFI archive up to a certain point and needing to find kind of other sources of oral history, um, other repositories for that kind of testimony that would be possible to, to use in the way that I wanted to use them. Um, in for a penny, in for a pound, I'm going to play the other clip of Christine that we used, sorry. <laughs> um, but this is from Mother of the Village. This is kind of the, towards the end of the record when we're talking about, um, you know, how, how these industries defined uh, the existence of these communities and how when you ripped that out of the community, you know, there's just this kind of void there. I was, I was extremely struck going to Evervale for the first time and, and um, looking, you know, being on the, on the, I think it's called the High Street or the Main Street and sort of thinking... Why is, why is this up on the hillside? Why, you know, wh why is that incredibly you know, promising looking sort of uh, floodplain, well, flat land down there? Why is that not built on? What's going on there? Being an idiot. And then of course he's shown, shown around the Ebervale Institute and you see the steelworks that used to be there, the very heart, the beating heart of that community. And when you go there, I think you can, you can sense that kind of loss in a community like that when it's been ripped away and when you know, they've tried their best to replace it, I suppose, with other community assets. But the very kind of foundation and, and kind of development of that that place is reliant on that industry and when it's it's ripped away so unceremoniously and with with nothing offered in return um no kind of retraining no kind of other vocational skills or qualifications just communities left to flounder and it was something i really want to make sure i addressed on the record and thankfully christine eloquently addressed that as well i remember all the shops that used to be in Pubs would be full on payday. And we get to realise what you mean by the death of a village. And about the pit being the mother of the village and all these phrases that sound all very romantic, but they are not romantic at all. They're true. I find it very moving watching that footage and obviously I'm, I'm not from here I don't have any particular ties to the area so I can only imagine what, what it meant what it means to anyone who grew up in the valleys and was kind of used to those those familiar scenes and then uh, saw the kind of the, the strife and, and destruction that followed in the 80s and 90s at the hands of a, a fairly ruthless mob um, yeah uh, I, I, just to sort of tie things off in terms of how we approach the record I'm aware that my lateness thanks to the M4 means we've run slightly over um, but it was important to me as well that we kind of try to embed ourselves in the community in terms of how we recorded the album. Uh, I'd done the previous record mostly in my garage in South East London, which I think is fine when you're writing about the space race because it's a subject so huge and so kind of dislocated that it, um, you know, it belongs to all of us and it's, it's everywhere and nowhere all at the same time. I think for, for the kind of record I wanted to make here, rooted in a community and reliant on the goodwill of that community, it felt right to find a suitable space within that community to come and record. Um, and my wife was not working at the time. She was, she was quite ill, so I kind of tried to find her things to do to distract her. And I gave her the task of, like, find us somewhere, you know, with a nice size hall or something, you know, try and find us somewhere in the valleys where we can record an album, take over a room for a month. And um, she found us a studio in Ebba Vale, um, Leaders Vale, which we thought was an auspicious sign because we also had a King Charles Cavalier, which is their logo. That's um, Kenny Dog Leash, by the way, their dog. Uh, <laughs> he was a character. Um, so their main studio was kind of just down the hall from here, but as soon as I saw this picture of the main kind of institute uh, lecture space, um, you know, my eyes just lit up. It's basically the same size and dimension as, as Abbey Road too, and the, the idea of kind of being able to set up camp there for a month um, and, you know, have some actual resonance, some physical resonance. You know, when you record a, sa a sound in a room, uh, unless you're recording extremely close up and, and baffling everything off and trying to isolate that sound so no, no kind of acoustic spill gets into it, you are kind of picking up the echoes of the institution, echoes of the room, you know, the kind of the air and the atmosphere at the time that you're recording in. So to be able to go to a room like this was a really vital part of it. And, um, we made a short film about it in, uh, in 2017, just to give you an idea of how we kind of adapted 
um, the room to our purposes and, and, you know, a bit of a behind the scenes glimpse, I suppose, of, of the making of the record. Keep it coming, keep it coming. Oh, this is starting to hurt my neck. Just watch the screen. Professional. Professional recording studio. The sound's gone out of sync for some reason. That's a good kick. I don't think many people get a chance to make an album like this anymore. You know, it's the first time we've had the luxury of actually spending a prolonged period of time in a studio, like on a on location almost, as it were. Even you know, wanting to do an album that way is 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 a kind of ambition these days. Really, there's not too many bands who can do it, so very lucky there. How was that? Dusty, come here. Talking to my Stop daughter. it. <laughs> Sit. Stay. Stay. Wait. Stay. She was quite a young puppy at that point, and uh, people had left a lot of scraps in that room for her to sort of uh, root out, so she had quite a field day. field day. Not the best kind of preparation for trying to really get your head in the space musically and record, you know, the perfect take when your dog is misbehaving. So, um, yeah, um, she's still the same today. But yeah, um, that's, that's kind of a, a broad view of, of us as a band, us as uh, our history, our potted history of the band, and, and how we came to make the record that we made with Every Valley. And, and the incredible kind of support um, from institutions like the South Wales Miners Library that we relied on in doing so, um, you know, and, and hopefully made something that, that resonates with people. I know, you know, we, we, do, we are lucky enough to have people coming up to us saying that this record means a great deal to them. I think really we're just, of all the bands out there, we really are the ones kind of standing on the shoulders of giants. You know, our, our work couldn't really exist without all the kind of other work that we're relying upon. Um, so, I'd just like to close by saying a, another enormous thanks to Sean and everyone at the South Wales Miners Library, everybody here for coming. Thank you for staying a bit later than intended. And um, yeah, thanks for listening to the record if you have. And if you are of an academic persuasion, please do be open to these kind of collaborations because um, unexpected and hopefully wonderful things can come as a result.